by running this seminar series and I'm honored to be a guest. So my co-authors are on the call and um, they'll be happy to answer your questions. So as the title suggests, uh, in this paper, we're interested in a set of trends that have occurred between the 1950s and today and the extent to which they're likely to continue to the rest of the 21st century. So those trends are well known. The first trend is that the world population is aging. So this graph shows you uh, the percentage of the population age 50 and above in five countries that together represent 50% of world GDP. Uh, and so the solid line shows you what's happened until today. Uh, the dashed line shows you population projections from the United Nations. Those were done before COVID, uh, but fortunately COVID is not materially affecting these trends. And so what you see is the world population has been aging on average substantially. So that share of the population age 50 or above has risen by 20 to 30 percentage points. Um, but the timing's uneven. And in countries like Japan, the aging transition is almost over. Uh, whereas in countries like China and especially India, uh, there's still a long way to go. So meanwhile, we've seen uh, large increases in wealth to GDP ratios in all of these countries, uh, as well as many others. Uh, and so this has been a fact documented by Thomas Piketty and co-authors. Uh, private wealth has risen by 100% of GDP and more uh, in most of the countries that he's looked at. Um, at the same time, we've seen declines in rates of return on wealth. Um, and so here, this is computed in the orange line as the total return on wealth, so total uh, capital and bond income divided by total uh, private wealth in the United States, um, that has seen a clear decline by about two percentage points uh, since the 1950s. There's also been a lot of focus on the decline in safe rates of return, uh, which is very pronounced since the 1980s, although safe rate of returns were also pretty low in the 1960s, and so the overall historical trend is not as clear. In this paper, we're going to be focusing on the orange line. So we'll be thinking about the total rate of return. This was going to be a model uh, in the baseline where there's a one asset um, and we can address the total return on wealth. Uh, but we have an extension of the paper where we also deal with portfolio compositions uh, and the extent to which demographics might have caused uh, the recent increase in the spread between the total return and the safe return. The final uh, trend that we're addressing is that of rising global imbalances. And so this shows you since the 1980s, diverging uh, net international investment positions of countries uh, where the United States has been running a large debt position abroad, uh, whereas countries like Germany and Japan have been accumulating large net foreign assets. So we have these four trends. Um, and our, the starting point for this paper is there's broad agreement that qualitatively, demographics has contributed to these historical trends in um, wealth to GDP ratios, net foreign asset imbalances, and total returns on wealth. Uh, but there's much less agreement about exactly how much historically. So if you look around the literature for an estimate of the extent to which demographics has contributed to the decline in real interest rates between the 1970s and today, um, you get answers that range from zero in the completely standard neoclassical model, where falling population uh, growth rates do not affect the long rate of return. Um, and when you're looking at models that specifically build in demographics with uh, an overlapping generations type structure and creating inelastic, inelastic asset demand, you get numbers that are below one uh, percentage point in a recent paper by Etienne Gagnon and co-authors at the Fed. Uh, or can go all the way to 3% or more. Um, this is uh, one paper I have here on the slides by um, Gauti Eggertson and co-authors that's uh, well known in this literature. And so you see wide range of estimates. And even more puzzlingly, uh, if you think about the future, um, there's actually a hypothesis that these trends might be reverting. Um, and this hypothesis is centered around the idea of what's happening to the savings rate in a population that's aging. And so here is the ECB chief economist, you know, who's one of the key factors he's looking at is the developments in long run natural rates of interest. So he's really clearly thinking about this question a lot. And he first summarizes the consensus, which is that in a large, um, when, when you have a large population cohort that's saving for retirement, that's putting upward pressure on the total savings rate. And so downward pressure on the interest rate. But then he says a large elderly cohort Maybe pushing down on aggregate savings because they'll be running down accumulated wealth. 
So maybe as retirement unfalls, we'll see falls in the savings rate and therefore increases in the real interest rate. Right? So that's a very popular hypothesis out there. Um, it's taken many forms over the years. Um, it's been called the asset market meltdown hypothesis by Jim Poterba about 20 years ago. And so there the, the, the worry was as baby boomers start to retire, which is kind of around now, um, they'll start selling assets and that will uh, uh, put downward pressure on asset prices or upward pressure on interest rates. Um, and more recently, there's been a book by Charles Goodhart that's been arguing for this idea of a great demographic reversal, uh, which in particular, um, one of the leading hypotheses is that interest rates would be going up uh, in, the, in the next couple of decades uh, because of demographic development. Okay, so what do we do in this paper? We're gonna provide a new uh, approach that's based on sufficient statistics uh, to think about this question. So what we're gonna show is that in a baseline multi-country general equilibrium overlapping generations model, uh, which is the type of structural models that are used to think about these questions, the effect of demographic change on total returns, the wealth to GDP ratio and net foreign asset positions depend only on four factors. The first two are observable factors. They are cross-sectional age profiles of asset accumulation, labor, income, and consumption. So you can get this from cross-sectional surveys. And demographic projections, which you can get from the United Nations or any other agency that projects out demographics. And so those are observable factors. And then we boil it down to just two elasticities. One is the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, which I call one over sigma. And the other one is the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor eta. So we have a framework that allows us to do measurement and we're gonna implement this measurement and come up with answers that are going to be dependent on just these two elasticities. And our quantitative conclusions as we'll show are going to be robust to many plausible extensions of this baseline model, which of course as any baseline uh, allowing us for analytical result, uh, we'll be making um, restrictive assumptions. And so we'll extend this in a quantitative uh, section of the paper. Okay, so let me, explain where our, the key idea behind our measurement exercise. Um, and the way to understand this is that in the long run in our model, um, equilibrium rates of return are determined by the intersection between a world asset supply curve and a world asset demand curve. And in a baseline, the world asset supply curve is just made up of capital. So this is capital accumulated by firms in all countries and as usual, in a, as a standard neoclassical mechanism, if interest rates are falling, the user cost of capital is falling and firms are substituting towards capital, accumulating more capital. Uh, and so that's pushing up on total world asset supply. And the slope of this asset supply curve is going to be dependent only on ADA, the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor and observables such as the depreciation rate or the total uh, capital to output ratio in, in the world. At the same time, there's an asset demand curve. And so this is where uh, overlapping generations differ from a standard neoclassical model. That asset demand curve is, in elast is, is partly inelastic. Um, and, and so that's conceived as uh, the pressure of, uh, at a given interest rate of total asset accumulation by agents that are saving for life cycle motives uh, and precautionary motives. Uh, and so they are accumulating all these assets and um, and uh, as interest rates go up, um, there is a certain slope that this asset demand uh, curve takes. And we're gonna show that we can reduce this to just the elasticity of intertemporal substitution and observable. So that's going to be a new result, which is going to help us characterize exactly the slope of the asset demand curve under certain conditions. Okay, so what do, how does demographic come into this picture? So this is, think of it as one steady state. What does demographic do? Well, it pushes out uh, the uh, world asset demand curve. Right? And um, in the way that we've normalized this graph where we divide by GDP, uh, it is actually not changing the asset supply curve uh, once normalized appropriately. And so the only thing that demographic is doing is it, it's increasing the level of asset demand at a given interest rate. And further, we're going to show that in the baseline model we write down, the entirety of the shift in the asset demand curve is going to be a compositional. Uh, so it's going to be something that we can observe uh, using just projections of, um, of changes and of population shares. 
uh, as well as existing cross-sectional profiles of asset accumulation and labor income. Um, and so we'll show you that this is very large and positive in the data. So for the world as a whole, demographics is pushing out world asset demand at a given interest rate. And we can measure the extent to which it's pushing it out um, if, if we're not changing interest rates. Okay, so what does this equilibrium framework then predict for, equilibria, uh, for equilibrium rates of return and equilibrium wealth uh, to GDP ratios? Well, um, to the extent that those changes are not too big, we can just use a first order approximation. Um, and so here we see that interest rates are falling and the wealth to GDP ratio is rising. And we can just quantify using a first order approximation the extent to which interest rates are falling and the, and the extent to which the wealth to GDP ratio is rising. And, and so you see that we have all the numbers that we need in order to do this calculation. So we know how much the asset demand curve is shifting. That's this delta bar comp term. And then we know the extent to, we know the slopes of asset supply and demand. Um, and so we can use that to form an estimate of the extent to which interest rates are falling. Right? And note here that interest rates are in fact falling. Uh, um, so there is, Kind of no justification in this framework for this asset market meltdown hypothesis view. And similarly, the wealth to GDP ratio will be rising, and the exact extent to which it will rise depends on the relative slope of the asset supply curve and the asset demand curve. Okay, so that addresses questions related to interest rates and wealth to GDP ratios. Now, how about net foreign asset positions? Well, the the shift in, um, the, as, in asset demand is country specific. It depends on country specific demographics. Um, and as we'll show in the data, those shifts are, are both large in every country, but also heterogeneous. And it depends primarily on the timing of the demographic transition. So in countries that are, uh, we'll call them slow aging countries, so countries that are close to completing their aging transition, the shift in asset demand is not going to be very large. Uh, relative to countries like China and India, which still have a long way to go, and there they will have a very big compositional effect, so very big uh, shift in asset demand. Um, so we can measure this heterogeneous shift, and then in equilibrium, once the interest rate suggested, um, th that that asset demand shift will tell us uh, how much net foreign asset positions are predicted to adjust. In fast aging countries that are just that have a compositional effect that's bigger than the average. Uh, we're going to be able to approximate the change in the NFA by the difference between um, their high compositional term and the, and the mean. And, and similarly, on the other side, for countries that are aging slower than the average, well, th those countries will have a low compositional term delta, uh, and therefore will predict them to run a current account uh, uh, deficit accumulating to a large net, uh, net foreign asset, negative net foreign asset position. Okay, so this framework also allows us to predict net foreign asset positions as we go forward. Um, and note that here, to the extent that asset supply and demand elasticities are not too different across countries, uh, this actually does not depend uh, to first order on the, um, on, on the equilibrium interest rate adjustment at all. Okay, so this is something that we can do without taking a stance on the, on the asset supply or uh, demand elasticities. Okay, so conclusion will be, Interest rates always fall because of demographics. The wealth to GDP ratio always rises, and there's large global imbalances. And that's um, uh, that's a conclusion that we can reach without taking too much of a stance on uh, the underlying model. Okay, so how do you think about this paper in the context of this broad literature that I thought about demographics? Well, we think of it as a bridge between reduced form analyses and structural analyses. So in the literature, there's been a reduced form approach to demographics. Uh, which has been thinking about shift share type approaches, uh, projecting out things like asset demand or, asset or savings rates, or projecting out things like labor supply based on current observed behavior and where we're thinking demographics will go. And those typically do not have uh, a, a general equilibrium component, right? So they're just simple projections. Um, but clearly, for thinking about determination of world interest rates or world wealth, we need a general equilibrium framework. So that's the type of framework that is provided by structural analyses, but it's typically based on fully specified general equilibrium overlapping generations models that are sometimes a little bit hard to parse. Um, and even though there are demographic inputs into these models and they engage with the data, they do not do, not do this in the way that we provide, which is a, a, a sufficient statistic type of approach where we just tell you exactly uh, what you should go about and measure. 
and, and by consequence, how you should be going about calibrating uh, those uh, structural models. Okay, so that's, um, that's this kind of gap bridging that we are hoping this paper is achieving. Okay, so let me uh, jump to our baseline environment. Um, so um, this is going to be a simplified model, as I said, because we're going after analytical results, um, but it embodies already a lot of the richness of uh, those fully structural general equilibrium overlapping models uh, that I was talking about. So it's an OLG model that features demographic change uh, in many countries uh, that all are facing the same world interest rate. So I'll call that RT. It potentially has a time varying path, um, but there's no aggregate uncertainty here. Um, and all countries are facing the same returns. So I'll drop country subtricts from, from now on uh, when there's no ambiguity. Uh, every country faces its own demographic process. Um, and in the baseline, what changes demographics is that there's a time varying sequence of births. Um, and so think of it as fertility changing over time. And so the number of newborns is changing over time. And then it just kind of percolates to the age distribution via uh, the, the, the natural pr process of death. Um, we are allowing for a constant sequence of mortality rates. So at given age J, J represents age, uh, your likelihood of surviving to the next period is going to be given by phi J. Um, and in the baseline, we're assuming that this is constant over time. So it varies across ages, but constant over time. Um, and we're also assuming that there's no migration. So the production function is going to be, or the, the production side of the model is completely standard. It's a neoclassical um, production model. So there's an aggregate production function with capital and effective labor a constant growth rate of labor augmenting technology. So I'm gonna call this gamma. Uh, so that's going to determine the baseline growth rate, uh, the real growth rate of the economy. And then perfect competition uh, and free capital adjustment. Okay, so standard neoclassical model on the supply side. And there's a government here um, that's um, doing some spending, government spending G, and then is running a tax and transfer system and so importantly, you can think of this as social security, although it could also be other, um, you know, performing other insurance functions. So our agents are going to be facing idiosyncratic risk. Um, and um, when they work, they'll be taxed at a constant rate tau. And they'll earn a wage W. And so the government collects all this tax income and then uses this uh, to finance a uh, transfer system that is um, here on the left-hand side, um, that's potentially indexed to age, agents' ages, like a social security system or agents inducing credit risk. Um, so um, like, a, like an unemployment insurance system. Um, and, um, and so we're allowing for a lot of generality here, but what's important for us, the key assumption we're going to make is that the government balances its budget over time in the face of changing demographics by adjusting either government spending or bonds, uh, but not the tax rate. So note I've assumed I've written the tax rate as a constant or the transfer system, right? So there's going to be constant transfers normalized by wages. Um, and so the government think of it in the long run, it has to adjust G, but it doesn't have to adjust it right away. It doesn't matter how it's adjusting it, um, but it adjusts uh, government spending in the face of changing demographics, okay? So of course here, there's a number of critical assumptions that are unrealistic that I'm going to relax later. One is that there's constant mortality over time. Right? So I'm not allowing for increases in longevity, which is going to be an important factor for savings. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Also no migration, which is important for understanding the age distribution in many countries. Um, so we'll relax that later too. And then the, this critical assumption that, that budget balance is achieved by changing your government spending as opposed to say change, cutting social security um, uh, benefits or raising taxes, and that's also something we want to address, right? But it, the, the benchmark allows us for analytical results, uh, and so we'll, um, we'll make these assumptions. So um, we have heterogeneous agents. Uh, there are overlapping generations of them. Uh, each uh, cohort, so I'll, I'll denote the cohort by K, and so the, your age, as I said, is uh, J, so that's, that's time minus cohort. Um, each agent is solving a relatively standard problem uh, in, in these overlapping generations models where they're uh, choosing consumption um, uh, over time um, to um, maximize a certain um, objective function. 
where they have a baseline consumption smoothing motive. They understand their own mortality. Uh, so they understand they're discounting the future more as we go because um, they, are, they are increasingly less likely to be around. Um, we're also allowing for age-specific utility modifier. Right? So that could be explaining why consumption isn't quite smooth over the life cycle. Um, um, and, and, and so that's, that's allowed in a baseline. It just can change over time, um, and, but it can change over ages. Uh, and then, so what's the, um, what's the asset market structure? So here in this baseline, we're allowing for annuities. So our agents earn the real interest rate RT, which is this world interest rate. Uh, that's the key equilibrium object. Um, and then they're, they can trade in annuities. So these annuities can be indexed to their idiosyncratic income realization, but they can be indexed uh, to, uh, or they're, they're, they're insuring them against mortality risk. Right? And so you see here, the return is boosted by their uh, likelihood of surviving to the next period. Um, so so uh, the, the, the specific structure of income is agents have a certain risky labor supply that is indexed by their ZJ, that's your idiosyncratic income shock at a point in time. And they also receive those transfers. And as I said, those transfers are very general. They can in fact be indexed to the entire history of their shocks. Um, and um, that's, that's, that's capturing things like social security or unemployment insurance, right? So there's an arbitrary stochastic process here uh, that determines their labor supply and uh, their transfers. Um, but note that otherwise the tax rate is a constant, uh, as I was saying earlier. Um, and then once agents collect all their post-tax and transfer income, they can, and, and their resources from last period invested in annuities, they can choose to either consume that or save that to the next period. When they save, they save uh, subject to the borrowing constraint. Okay, so that's a pretty general model in that it, it embodies a lot of what we think is important for savings motives for agents. It has, um, there is a life cycle motive. Uh, there's potentially motives that have to do with whether your children are in the household at a point in time that would be captured by the PSI. Um, and there's precautionary motives um, as well as constraints. Right? So it, it has a lot of these features that we think are very important to model uh, life cycle uh, savings decisions. Oh, hey, Adrian, I have a clarification question here. So it seems that uh, the agents do not trade the representative firm's shares. Is that because the firm basically has zero profit in this new classical setting? Yeah, so the firm makes zero profits. Yeah, but you could you could think of the the annuity. Um, you know, the, the 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 person that sells you the annuity. You know that that that's uh, that's an insurance company, and that insurance company owns the capital stock. Right? So the exact way in which we'll do this actually um, is is like that. So the insurance company has a, you know itself is invested in the capital stock, um, and and here we're just modeling the problem of the agent. Uh, that's just trading these annuity contracts. So that's a good question. Um, okay, so what's equilibrium here? Well, equilibrium is defined given demographics and, and government policy. Um, and in the world equilibrium, households are optimizing, firms optimize, and global assets market clear, which just says that the total amount of accumulated wealth by households uh, must be equal to the total supply of assets. Uh, which here is going to be given by capital as well as all the bonds that have been issued by uh, governments. So from here, we're gonna be considering two cases, um, each with countries facing a constant gamma. So we're, uh, we're assuming that the growth rate, um, the real growth rate um, uh, of labor augmenting technology is a constant. There can be changes in growth rates due to changes in composition of the labor force. Um, but a constant overall uh, growth rate of labor augmenting technology. And we're going to study the case of a small country that's aging on its own, uh, where the world is at a steady state. So that's a, an exercise where we're trying to isolate the pure effect of changing demographics for one country if that country is small. Uh, so it's a causal effect of demographics if I'm not affecting the world. Um, and then we'll think about many countries aging together, which is the more natural case where uh, we're, we're thinking about all countries uh, uh, saving at the same time and putting pressure on world interest rates. Um, and, and we'll think of that as a world where we're converging to a long run steady state, where we have a demographic steady state, and that world will face a certain long run interest rate, our long run, 
and we're interested in characterizing that. Okay, so the first result in the paper is that uh, for this small country aging alone, um, the, uh, that country is facing a constant real interest rate because the world is at a, at a steady state and a constant gamma, a constant growth rate of labor augmenting technology. For that country, its wealth to GDP ratio is purely given by a compositional term. So it's given by the ratio of uh, a term that is taking mean assets of agents. So AJ0 here is the mean assets of agents at given age. And the way it enters the uh, wealth to GDP ratio expression is taking the mean with respect to a distribution of ages that can vary over time. Um, so take the initial age uh, distribution and then take the mean of that with respect to the time varying age. That's uh, giving you a numerator. Now do the same thing where we take in the denominator average pre-tax labor income by age. So this reflects uh, the effect that um, changing age composition has on the overall amount of labor, effective labor supply in the economy. Um, and when you take the ratio of these two terms, that gives you a wealth to GDP ratio projection uh, for this economy. And the only thing that this economy, um, this, is the, this is the characterization of the full path of the wealth to GDP ratio. Right? So these, this compositional term is the only term that is relevant for the wealth to GDP ratio. Right? So if we want to think about the GE demographic impact over time, that's going to be given by constant real interest rate and then a change in the wealth to GDP ratio for that country, also equal to the change in the NFA for that country, equal to this term delta comp, which I was showing you in the graph earlier, uh, which is the difference between the wealth to GDP ratio at a point in time T versus uh, the zero wealth to GDP. And, and this is measurable from demographic projections and household surveys, because all we need are those asset profiles at a given point in time in a cross section of asset accumulation and pre-tax labor income. Okay, so what's the intuition for this result? Well, in the model that I wrote down, there is no direct effect of demographics on normalized individual decisions. So there's baseline growth, which we take out. And so when you're thinking normalized, I said individual decisions, um, netting out the growth, those decisions are not affected by demographics directly. Right? And if you think back to what affects the time varying age distribution here, it's changes in uh, fertility or changes in the number of newborns that is not affecting directly anything that agents optimize over. Right? And so therefore their decisions are constant. And so they just keep choosing the same amount of uh, assets. Uh, they have the same amount of um, labor income once normalized uh, at each age. And so they are just making the same choices uh, accumulating the same amount of assets. Okay, so that's, um, that, that, that tells us that we can measure this extent to which demographics affecting the wealth of GDP at constant interest rates using uh, pure cross-sectional uh, cross data. Okay, so now what happens in the world equilibrium, which is the more relevant case, the case where all countries are aging at the same time? Well, the interest rate has to adjust to clear global asset markets, right? So as I said, at fixed interest rates, the left-hand side here, uh, is just pushed up by the average compositional effect. So this is now something we can measure country by country. And then we can say, this is the total amount by which desired wealth accumulation goes up if interest rates weren't changing. And then in equilibrium, interest rates have to fall. So when interest rates are falling, this will push up on uh, capital um, to output ratios across countries via the standard neoclassical mechanism. And it may be also pushing down on um, the, the desired wealth to GDP ratio because lower interest rates uh, with the dominant substitution effect uh, will mean that countries accumulate less assets. So the exact magnitude of the adjustment is going to depend on the sensitivity of W over Y and K over Y to the interest rate. So for the next result, I'm, I'm gonna be focusing on the long run steady state, uh, which I've indexed by long run. Uh, I'm in particular interested in where the interest rate is going relative to where it is at the beginning. And so what you see here is that um, that, is a, that is just given by the shift in the asset demand curve divided by the sum of the sensitivities. And so I give you the intuition with the graph at the beginning, and this is just formalizing this. 
Um, and similarly, the change in the wealth to GDP ratio for the world as a whole is given by the product of this compositional term that we measure uh, and then multiplied by the ratio of the supply sensitivity to the sum of supply and demand. Um, in addition, we can project out long run changes in country and foreign asset positions by uh, just taking um, the rate, the, the difference between the, 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 the projected asset supply change at constant interest rates for a, for a given country C, um, what, once we net out the overall mean effect for all countries, there is an, ex, there's an additional term to the extent that countries specific supply and demand um, sensitivities are different from the average. Uh, but if those, if those things are similar, uh, then it doesn't actually matter how much of the shift in interest rates there is. All that matters is, the, um, is, is this term, which is purely uh, measurable. Okay, so the final thing we need is expressions in order to sign, not, not just sign, but also um, give a magnitude to the change in interest rate. We need sensitivities of asset supply and demand. Right? So on the supply side, it's a standard neoclassical model. So the sensitivity of the capital to output ratio is simply given by eta, the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor, the user cost of capital in the steady state, uh, which is the interest rate plus the depreciation rate and the capital to output ratio uh, averaged across the world. So that's all of this is measurable except for eta. And on the demand side, we have this new result, um, which, um, which characterizes for a given country, the sensitivity of their long run asset demand to a given interest rate as a function of purely measurable objects and sigma, the elasticity of intertemporal uh, sigma, or one of our sigma is the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. Right. So for this, we're going to restrict to no reducing credit risk, no borrowing constraint, um, and R equals gamma equals zero. We have extensions in the paper. Um, but there, uh, in this particular case, you have a very clean expression uh, that allows you to think about the magnitudes that are involved when you're, say, increasing the world interest rate uh, and thinking about the overall effect on asset accumulation. So increasing the world interest rate has a substitution effect and an income effect. And the substitution effect, of course, scales with the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. But what is very nice is that it is just a function of the variance of the age of consumption. Right? So think of the age of consumption as a random variable. Uh, you take that variance. Um, so this is something that you could uh, compute from a profile of consumption over age. Um, um, that's going to give you the substitution effect. Right? So what's the idea? Well, imagine that everybody just consumed at one age at the very end, they're just not exploiting intertemporal substitution. And so if interest rates are changing, that's not affecting their substitution, right? But more realistically, people consume all over their life cycle, right? And so the profile of consumption is kind of telling you already how much baseline substitution they're doing. Um, and so if interest rates are going up, they can take full uh, advantage of the increase in interest rates over their whole life cycle to substitute, say, by raising their consumption later in life. Um, and so it turns out that the variance of the age of consumption is sufficient for characterizing the overall amount of substitution. Similarly, when interest rates are going up, there's an income effect. Um, and that income effect, um, you can see, it will depend on the exact timing of the earning of income versus the earning of consumption or the spending on consumption because right, higher interest rates uh, mean that you have to sustain consumption to later ages, right? so that it's a negative effect for you. It's, uh, it can, um, it's a negative income effect, um, but you also have, um, you, you're also um, uh, discounting future income at a higher rate. Um, and so those two effects, um, it turns out, uh, can be characterized for the overall demand elasticity uh, as just the difference between the mean age of, of assets and the mean age of consumption. So um, that it's an effect that can be positive or negative. It'll turn out in the data, it's negative, right? So that's capturing this idea that if interest rates say, well, are falling, people might be saving more uh, from the income effect, but we can race that against the substitution effect. You know? And what is really interesting here is that we can just measure most of these terms except for the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. And so we can give you a sense of the magnitudes, right? As it will turn out, except if elasticities of intertemporal substitution are extremely low, the substitution effect will always vastly dominate the income effect. And so the asset uh, demand elasticity will always be positive. 
OK, so let me turn to the measurements. So kind of show you some of these numbers. And so we have a framework um, that um, we've written down where we just need to measure a number of cross-sectional objects. And then we need to pick two values for the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor and the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. And we can answer in a reduced form way all the questions that I said to answer. So let's kind of turn to the data. So we're going to be calculating this shift chair or compositional term delta for the United States and 24 other countries. Uh, so we collect data, uh, survey data uh, on uh, income and asset accumulation by age uh, from all of these countries. And then we're going to just implement our shift chair exercise uh, by just taking baseline wealth to GDP ratio for each of these countries. Uh, and then once we have the survey, we can compute this term, which um, rolls over the, 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 the projection projected age distribution, country specific, uh, over fixed uh, profiles of assets and uh, labor income. Um, and, and so we take population projections from the United Nations and these age and wealth profiles from different surveys. There's questions as to how we go from, uh, from households, which are in the surveys, to individuals. So there we're going to split up the wealth among all the adults in the households. Uh, we'll look at various robustness to various assumptions. And what exactly do we include in AJ in uh, the, the asset, total assets at a given age. Um, to the extent we can, we want to include the funded part of defined benefits, benefits pension. And so we have uh, these estimates from this uh, nice uh, several House and Angers, uh, Henrikus Bulls paper for the United States. Okay, so that's our measurement. What do we get out of this? Well, we get this profile of W over Y at constant interest rates. Um, the, and so here, note, uh, we can do this backwards. So we can say, starting in 1950, is people had two days asset profiles and labor profiles. What would the wealth to GDP ratio have been, looking at the age distribution back then? And then we project it out. And so the key thing I want you to take away from this graph is that those magnitudes are really large. Uh, so we get, so this is in units of, of, of GDP, right? So 100 means W over Y change of 100 uh, of 100 or 100% 100 of GDP wealth accumulation uh, just due to the compositional effect uh, between uh, 1950 and today. And it's projected to keep going up, uh, of course, depending on demographic projections, it might go up uh, more or less, um, but by at least the same amount. Right? So for comparison, we can look at what happened to the wealth to GDP ratio uh, since the 1950s. And according to the pkt zuckman estimates, it's been rising by around 100% of GDP. Right? So it's about the same magnitude. Right? So this compositional effect of aging is really large in the data. Um, and it's predicted to keep going up uh, at, at, at about the same pace. So what's driving this? So in order to understand this, we have to go back to the um, components of the compositional term. Um, so one is the fact that um, the asset accumulation profiles of households rises steeply only starting around age 40 and then stays flat uh, after age 60, right? So there's very little asset decumulation in the data. Uh, so this, uh, uh, the back line shows you this for the United States uh, at, uh, in the latest SCF. Um, and so you see very little asset decumulation. So wealth kind of plateaus on average at um, around $700,000. It doesn't fall that much. Um, and so this graph is overlaid with the age distribution at, at this point um, in 2016. Um, and then we can look at what happens to the projected age distribution um, to the end of 2100. And you see that most of the gains in age buckets are due to these old ages um, where, um, and so that's going to push up average compositional wealth. Right? Uh, and most, most of the falls in the population uh, distribution uh, are due to the, uh, the young ages where there's very little asset accumulation. Right? So over time, um, that explains why um, we're seeing an increase uh, in the numerator of our expression. Right? So how about the denominator? So the denominator has to do with labor supply. Right? And so there, it's a little bit more subtle because the peak of age uh, earning years is more like 40 to 45. Right? And so what's happening going forward is actually we see all these retirees that are leaving the labor market and they're pushing down on total labor supply. Uh, and so they're pushing down on the denominator of our expression. Right? So that's this effect over here. 
But you see that it's more subtle as to what happened in the past. In the past, there's been this phenomenon called the demographic dividend, where young ages kind of came into the labor market and, and increased overall labor supply. And, and so historically, that effect has contributed in the other direction. Going forward, it'll squarely push down on, on GDP and therefore push up on the wealth to GDP ratio. Right? So in the paper, we can separate the contribution of the numerator and the denominator. So how much is asset accumulation versus how much is, is to labor supply or GDP. Um, and W contributes about two thirds going forward. Y contributes about one third. But as I said, the demographic dividend was pushing things in the other direction in the past. Okay, so this is a very large effect for the United States, which is here in the middle. Um, so it's about 147 points of GDP uh, for projected desired wealth. Uh, but you see that those numbers are very large in every country that we look at. Um, and they're also very heterogeneous. Right? So in China and India, uh, we're expecting to see very large increases in wealth to GDP ratios from this compositional effect, whereas in countries uh, like Japan that have um, already kind of undergone a lot of their transition or Germany, uh, we're not expecting as much. Right? So there's this big heterogeneity and we know the heterogeneity translates into NFA imbalances. Right? Um, so so um, before I do that, let me quantify sensitivities. So uh, as I said, the supply side elasticity is uh, given entirely by observable things and the elasticity of uh, cap uh, capital labor substitution. The demand side sensitivity is given entirely by age profiles as well as the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. And so here I do this for the world as a whole, and then I plot this as a function of the elasticity of intertemporal substitution to get a sense of the magnitudes. And so here, because I, I know this is a finance audience, I extended this graph all the way to really large elasticities of intertemporal substitution, uh, where you see if you pick a number like two for the EIS, then the demand sensitivity is a number like four to 500. So if you remember how the interest rate is determined, it's the ratio of a numerator uh, delta bar comp, which you can think of as a number like 150, and then you divide by the sum of two terms. And this is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, so if this is 500, this is gonna be a really tiny change in the interest rate, right? But most macroeconomists would think that we're about over here, right? And there's some disagreement as to exactly where. Um, and so there, um, there, the, the demand uh, uh, sensitivities are, are lower, but note that it has to be, that EIS is really, really low before we have a dominant income effect. Right? Um, and so that's kind of the key benefit of this quantification formula where I have the variance of age of consumption, which I can measure and I know is big in the data in order to get at the demand sensitivity, right? And so this kind of range over here compares favorably to literature estimates that I've tried to estimate this uh, sensitivity directly. Okay, so what do we get when we put in all these numbers together? We get a change in the world interest rate that's kind of a menu um, that depends on the assist of intertemporal substitution and the capital labor substitution. Um, in a baseline, which we'll take to be pretty representative of a macro literature, we get a fall in the world interest rate that's about 118 basis points, right? So 1.18 points. Uh, but of course, if you reduce the elasticity of intertemporal substitution and the elasticity of capital labor substitution, you can, you can get numbers like some of the ones I was uh, talking about in the introduction um, that are like as high as uh, three or as low as you know, 0.59. Um, now, what we've traced this back to is just these two parameters. And so I think this is the key benefit of this uh, approach or we just say this is going to be entirely due to what your assumptions are on the elasticity of intertemporal substitution and the capital labor sensitivity. Right? And so similarly, in our benchmark case, we have a big compositional effect, but the overall effect of that is dampened by the fact that there is a relatively large demand elasticity. Um, so if we're thinking about the overall projected increase in world wealth to GDP ratio, that might be a number like 77%. Okay, so the um, other thing we can do is net foreign asset projections. Um, so this shows you, again, repeats the formula, and this shows you historical movements in net national investment positions. And then from the pure compositional analysis, where do we expect global imbalances to go? And it turns out that the United States, because it has a projected um, compositional effect that's lower than the world, the United States is predicted uh, to keep running really large uh, current account deficits accumulating to a very negative international investment position by the end of the, 20, the 21st century, while countries 
like uh, China early on, and then especially India later on as its demographic uh, transition unfolds, uh, starts push having really large positive international investment positions. Now, you might say, well, that's all theory. You know, how do we know that this has any bearings to reality? It's kind of nice theory in that it doesn't put too much structure, but it's nice to go and check historically against the historical record. So if we go back to 1970, and we say, let's do the compositional analysis back then, projecting out to 2015, what we'd expect, the, what we can measure as the compositional effect, and then look at what actually happened to net foreign investment positions, or net foreign asset positions, it's actually kind of done quite well, right? So at least we can say the slope is, is positive, but it's also pretty close to the 45 degree line, right? With Japan having the largest projected increase in its compositional term, and also the largest actual increase in its NFA, um, and countries like Ireland being negative on both ends, right? So this suggests that this is, even though of course lots of other things have changed and demographics is not the only driver of NFAs, this actually does a pretty good job. Okay, so I think I have two, two minutes, about two minutes left. So let me briefly tell you about what else we do in this paper, right? So one thing is we relax all these quantitative assumptions uh, of these restrictive assumptions that we've, that I've made um, in a quantitative model. Um, so what do we allow for? We allow for um, an asset um, that's, so we're, we're removing annuities. We're saying agents um, own, a, um, have no ability to um, invest in annuities, but they have an asset that's not contingent on their um, wealth that, that then there is um, unintended bequests. And so we have to deal with bequests. Um, and so we give bequests to newborns uh, as well as kind of over the life cycle in a realistic manner. We allow for time variation in mortality, utility shifters that we're microfunding from the presence of kids in the household, and we're looking at how many kids are in different households at different ages. We're allowing for retirement to be uh, uh, with an age that's retirement age that's pushed up over time. Um, and then fiscal adjustments that can be on social security, taxes and transfers versus um, uh, kind of retirement age and so on. And so we are allowing for the types of uh, variations that the literature has been thinking about. Um, and then it turns out in our baseline, the projection that we make, uh, and remember those two numbers are critical, we've already shown this, but uh, say for, for a particular baseline choice of parameters, the pure compositional analysis versus the fully structural model actually deliver very similar results right, in terms of projected interest rates, well to GDPs and FAs and so on. Right? Now, of course, it is possible uh, to uh, change assumptions in the structural model to get vastly different results if say you loaded all the adjustments on social security on lowering benefits, um, which would lead agents to dramatically increase their savings. And so you can see you get much larger declines in the world interest rate in that case, or you'd load it all on social security taxes, uh, which goes the other way, right? And so those are the two extremes here. The most extreme numbers that we can get, of course, um, will depend on our social security assumptions, uh, but in a baseline, uh, the compositional analysis actually does great. Okay. Um, other topics we cover, um, multiple assets, as I said, um, housing, population aging, and wealth inequality. So we have lots of extensions of this compositional type analysis for thinking about alternative um, mechanisms. And one that I just want to briefly mention in my last minute is the savings rate. So tying back to my introduction, where some people were arguing maybe the savings rate will be falling, and so that will put upward pressure on the interest rate. And there's an interesting twist here which is that we can actually do a compositional analysis for the savings rate, and then we can measure that across countries, and we do see that it falls. So there's some truth to this idea that demographics will be pushing down on the savings rate over time. But the thing that's missing from this analysis is that it is not the savings rate that matters for the interest rate, it's the level of wealth. And it is the case that as it declines, but wealth actually increases because the wealth to GDP ratio is the ratio of the savings rate, to the growth rate and population de growth declines will push down on the growth rate um, more than it pushes down on the savings rate. And so you get an increase in the wealth to GDP ratio uh, from uh, this um, phenomenon. Okay, so how does population aging affect wealth output ratios, real rates and capital flows? Uh, well, we can use a compositional analysis um, as a starting point for forecast and we actually do a really good job just using this analysis uh, compared to a structural model. Um, we get really large and heterogeneous effects in the data, and this approach predicts for the 21st century. 
um, that interest rates will definitely fall, so refuting the asset market meltdown hypothesis, and that the global savings glut has just begun, and that we'll tend to see very large uh, net foreign asset positions in the future, uh, just from the pressure of demographics. All right, so thank you very much, and I'm uh, really looking forward to the Q&A. All right, thank you, Adrian. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or type something in the chat, we'll be able to get to you. So to kick this off, um, I have one question to ask. So Adrian, how do you think about uh, the comparison or difference between a genuine decline in all discount rates, which is captured by this R or R star versus mm -hmm. a convenience yield increase, which means people really emphasize on the specialty, specialness of some selected safe assets. And the increase in the convenience yield means that uh, these safe assets have a much higher valuation compared with all these other or riskier assets. Yeah, so this speaks to an extension I didn't really have time to mention on, of, the, of the model on uh, thinking about multiple assets, right? So here, I think I just first to think about kind of a baseline uh, asset price or a baseline interest rate, uh, I think that the most natural starting point is a model like this one where there's no distinction between different assets. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think that we, we can think of demographics as affecting um, that through the lens of the type of framework I've presented. Now, convenience yields are kind of well-documented uh, in, in the data. Um, and they're also um, kind of well documented to change over time. And you've done work on this and I know and you know, many others. And, and so the way to put this into this framework would be to add an, multiple assets and say, maybe uh, the, the spread between the risk-free rate and, and other assets uh, could be due to a convenience yield. Um, and, and now the, the key question for us would be, how is that changing with demographics? And, and so we can actually go about um, uh, uh, this analysis in, uh, through the lens of our framework. So we can say, well, how many safe assets versus risky assets are different um, ages holding, right? And then how is, um, how is demographics likely to affect this? So this actually shows you kind of this analysis um, where we've, we've, we've looked at across ages how many kind of safe versus risky assets agents are holding. So the profile of net safety demand um, and um, uh, uh, relative to the age distribution. And then we can think about projecting this out using demographics. So that would kind of give you a quantification of the effect of demographics on uh, the, uh, the, the safety premium. Hanno, you had a question? Um, yeah, I, I, this, this was super interesting. Thanks. Um, I, I have a question about um, sort of the pattern we see in uh, interest rates across countries. So there's there's an okay. interesting pattern, which is that I guess countries that have historically been running large current account surpluses uh, like Japan tend to have uh, much lower interest rates than other countries that have uh, tended to run deficits. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some interesting patterns with respect to exchange rates as well. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you've, you've thought about um, these patterns in the context of your model, I guess, um, that would require thinking perhaps about uh, different uh, types of consumption goods and, and differences in interest rates and a role for exchange rates. But I think that might be an interesting dimension to explore, perhaps not in this paper, but. Yeah, I agree. So, I, I mean, so this uh, multiple asset analysis here is just partial equilibrium. Yeah. Right? And so then you might say, well, how would that translate in general equilibrium where so there's maybe imperfect substitutivity between uh, you know, different kinds of country assets and some some restriction on world arbitrage that, uh, or, or risk premia that are uh, preventing equalization of safe, uh, safe rates across all countries. Um, and, and maybe, you know, also multiple goods uh, where this would have repercussions for the steady state level of real exchange rates. Um, and so I, so I think this is really interesting and I, I think that those uh, facts are pretty fascinating. Yeah, this is kind of a first pass where we say, well, first of all, sure. we just want to understand Imagine there's a one good world and one asset world. Um, mm -hmm. what, how, do, how can we think about the determination of interest rates in the first pass? But I agree with you that those facts are kind of clearly relevant and interesting. And yeah, I think of this as in the next paper in this 
kind of approach uh, just and and, th and there's there's some work I should say there's some work already thinking about the effects of demographics on say the equity premium in a more um, in a structural um, environment and so I th we we think that there is something that this compositional analysis can bring to this literature but it is of course like substantially more complicated to solve these these structural models and so we're not there sure um, yeah yeah okay thanks.